All right, good morning, everybody. Well, um, now that Diane's here, we'll, uh, we'll start our meeting. <laughs> um, uh, this, we'll uh, commence the uh, 28th meeting of the uh, Canaveral Port Authority Board of Commissioners. First, we'll uh, please say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Commissioner Allen, would you please join us? Lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, let's uh, recognize some of our uh, people who are here today. Um, our ambassadors, uh, Dennis Hepburn, good morning. Bob Sox, in from uh, one of his walks. Uh, Jim Hanley. Mac McClouth, Susie Wasden, good morning. Uh, let's have a round of applause for these people. Thanks for your work. Uh, though she's on Facebook, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my wife, Barbara, because today is our anniversary. Oh. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> um, we'd like to ask for an approval of the agenda. So move, Mr. Chairman. We're good with it, John. No changes. All right. All in favor? Aye. Five zero. Oh. <coughs> I'm sorry. Kevin, I did. Sorry, the microphone was not here. <coughs> okay. Also, look, uh, ask for uh, a motion for the approval of the minutes of our last 24 March meeting. I moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Five zero. Oh. <coughs> okay. Um, we got a nice, uh, a, a nice way to kick off our meeting this morning. Uh, in our charter, as it should be, uh, we are required annually to uh, to receive a commercial fishing update. Uh, we we are uh, it's uh, important and embedded and, and a forever part of this port. And so um, we're supposed to get a, a public hearing every two years on the state of commercial fishing in, fishing industry. Uh, the hearing was properly noticed. Um, invitations were sent to our commercial fishing tenants, um, Cape Canaveral Shrimp, Shrimp Company, which is Wild Ocean and Seafood Atlantic. You all are here. It's wonderful to see you all. And I understand uh, we've got a, a presentation. And uh, I'm sorry, you are? Cynthia. Cynthia, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to thank the commission. Maybe we shouldn't have gone uh, sound or something. When you were talking, it sounded like there was somebody else. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Let me turn it down a little bit. I don't know. Turn my hearing aid down. <laughs> Thank the commissioners for giving uh, giving us the opportunity to update the community. Like you said, it's incredibly important, uh, not just for the community, but food security, I think, in, uh, in Florida. Um, so my name is Cynthia Sandoval. I work for Wild Ocean Seafood Market, which is a receiving dock uh, out here in Port Canaveral. Come visit us if you have. We have, uh, we have tours uh, once a month. On Saturdays. So uh, I'm here to actually uh, give an update on the state of the fisheries for Port Canaveral. Um, Jim from Seafood Atlantic couldn't be here, but I will give an overall synopsis of what's been going on. Also, um, the rest of Wild Ocean is here in case anyone has any questions. They're going to help me answer any questions that I might not be able to answer. So, um, why is can anyone hear me without the microphone? Yeah, we're good. I can, I'm from Miami, so I can speak yeah. really loud. Ma'am? Yes. You need to oh, sorry. And, uh, speak in the mic, so you need to record. Okay, you need to record it. Okay. Um, so why is it important? Uh, first of all, uh, commercial fishers feed the people. I think there's a real disconnect between food and commercial fishing. Um, I don't think most people realize how much uh, seafood uh, can be harvested from Florida and the importance of that when it comes to food security. So that's foremost uh, why it is important. Um, second, the economics of it, the money, of course, and a lot of times that's what's important. Uh, the sustainability and regulation of the industry and uh, how we're historically and presently significant to Port Canaveral. Um, I don't know if most people know, but we have the second longest coastline in the United States, uh, right after Alaska, meaning that we have prime real estate for harvesting seafood, both in state and federal waters. We harvest over 80 uh, species of har uh, species of seafood. The reason it's so much and so diverse is because we have warmer waters here. 
uh, so that lends itself to, to more species. Um, as opposed to up north where really it's a handful of species that you can harvest. Um, and these two dots, there's over 3 million pounds of seafood harvested um, in about 600 feet of bulkhead. Uh, I would consider that extremely productive. Um, this is just an example of the product variety that can come from uh, this area. I'm hoping that most of you are, uh, can, can identify most of these species. If not, uh, I'll go through, through some of them. We have golden crab, some golden tilefish, which, uh, side note, used to be a fish that no one knew about uh, up until maybe 10, nine years ago uh, when Red Snapper uh, went on a moratorium. And then we actually facilitated this fish into a lot of restaurants and we're able to make it a lot more popular. And we're probably one of the uh, more premier uh, harvest sites for golden tilefish. Um, Pompano, lane snapper, amberjack, lesser and a greater, uh, also tilapia, which is a local invasive species, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of species uh, that we capture here or harvest here in Florida. Um, I'm sure that you've seen this before. I think two years ago I um, had this in my presentation where uh, compared to, uh, well, this is a seafood consumed in the United States. In about 85 to 95% of the seafood consumed in the United States is imported. That does include uh, Alaskan salmon that's exported to be processed and imported back into the country. So mind you that <laughs> that's in these figures. Um, 15 to 5% is domestic. I would like to think in Florida, uh, the imports are a little lesser than that just because we have so much access, but it's pretty comparable. Um, and I don't think anyone's saying that imports are bad. They're not, we need them. Uh, I don't think anyone, we would ever fulfill the supply, the demand in the United States uh, for seafood without imports. But I also think that we could probably feed Florida uh, within Florida, yeah, from Florida. Um, and out of those imports, and I think this is a really surprising figure, uh, about 2% are inspected uh, by the FDA. So um, from, I always like to say this in most of my presentations, is that if you ever go to the FDA website, there is a refusal list. So anything that's refused uh, uh, that has been um, inspected is on that list. And usually the top two industries of which refusals come from are seafood and cosmetics, always number one or two. The reason for refusals are usually um, spoiled, mislabeled, or banned veterinary drugs are used. Uh, so it's just uh, a plethora of reasons why. Um, and why is this important? Once again, food security. Um, there's a lot of regulation in, uh, in play, not just uh, permits for catching harvest, uh, harvested seafood, but also the way that it's processed here in the United States, uh, i.e., you know, not using banned veterinary drugs, for example. Um, so we'll move on to the economics of that. So I don't think most people know this, but um, in the top fishing ports for Florida in 2018, and mind you, these reports are about two, three years belated. Uh, that's how long it takes for them for the gather information. Um, we're actually in the top 10 fishing ports for Florida, and that includes West Florida and East Florida, so Gulf and, and Atlantic. Um, landing weight, sixth. Um, landed value, eighth. Also, um, the top fishing ports for the South Atlantic, which include North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, um, we are in the top 10 again. Uh, seven and tenth uh, in landed value. So there's a real true economic value in this port. Mind you, that's only two receiving docks, 600 feet of bulkhead. Um, this is a great chart that I pulled from um, NOAA's uh, economic reports. Um, and this just shows you the amount of uh, number of jobs that have uh, they're associated with commercial harvesters and seafood dealers and processors. And this is without imports. There, there's plenty of seafood dealers and harvest, um, seafood dealers and processors in Florida that deal with imports, but this is specifically uh, to the ones that don't deal with imports. So pretty significant. Um, I don't know if any, everyone can see this. I should probably, <laughs> probably should have made this bigger, but this is also from that same report uh, from NOAA Fisheries. And if you notice on the left, uh, that's job impacts, about 86,000 in Florida. That does include I mean, South Atlantic, sorry. That includes uh, East Coast of Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And most of those jobs are coming from East uh, Florida, which is more productive than the other areas. Um, and also sales impact about 20, almost $20 billion from the South Atlantic. Um, and that leads us into sustainability and regulation. 
So there's really only one slide for this because this kind of tells you how much um, regulation there is in the industry. Um, before this, before the Florida trip ticket uh, application, let's say that I am a fisherman and I want to buy, uh, sell to Wild Ocean. I want to uh, harvest grouper. I need a permit myself to be able to sell to Wild Ocean. Wild Ocean needs a dealer uh, permit to be able to buy from me. Um, I don't just choose from one permit. There's several permits depending on how much I want to harvest uh, uh, in each trip. So is it 200, 500, 1,000 pounds? And depending on that permit, that's the permit I have. Um, the first four months of the year are closed off to uh, catching grouper under 600 feet of water. So I have to take that into note also. Um, and then uh, once I catch that product, I come into Wild Ocean, uh, they weigh it, and they have to fill out a Florida trip ticket. Um, Florida trip ticket. And this is the Florida trip ticket right here. For every batch of fish we receive, this is what we have to send to the government. Uh, it goes over the start date of your fishing, the unload date, which could be different than your start date, the number of uh, crew on your vessel, your vessel name, of course, the type of uh, trip. Is it commercial? Is it recreational? Is it charter? Um, the county, the type of gear, uh, the gear sets, the gear quantity, your license, of course, um, your vessel license, uh, the area which it was fished in, because that's going to determine the regulation, state waters, federal waters, so on and so forth, the depth of which you fish, the time fish, the soak time, how much, uh, how long was your gear in the water for? Uh, this is particularly important to, let's say, blue crab, which some of the gear is in there for, you know, one to two days. Um, the quantity of that fish, the species code, the species itself, how much we paid for it, um, and that's not what we pay on triple tail right now. That's from like 2010, FYI. <laughs> um, was it gutted? Was it whole? Was it headed? Um, did you sell it? Did you use it personally? Was it for research? Uh, was it caught, uh, seized by law enforcement? And then finally, um, this is sent to the state and the federal government at least once a week. So mind you, if you caught triple tail and cobia, this isn't, this isn't just for uh, both at the same time. It's actually, you have you have to list every species on this trip ticket. Did I catch cobia today and tomorrow? Um, I'll catch it tomorrow. Two different uh, trip tickets. So pretty, pretty involved. <laughs> um, and I know I didn't mention this in the first slide, but we will go over the COVID-19 effects. Uh, well, you know, I, I think it's affected everyone, so it's pretty important to mention it. Um, this, uh, these two charts, uh, infographs, come from the Fish and Fisheries uh, Scientific Journal. Uh, I think it came out in November 2020, um, and it just shows you the percent com uh, of imports uh, that came in, seafood imports, uh, compared to uh, 2019. If you notice, the imports uh, dipped way down in about uh, April, you know, March, when everything closed down, uh, both frozen and live. Um, luckily, frozen went up a bit because of demand from grocery stores, from people uh, cooking at home. Live uh, live and fresh product, not so much. Uh, same thing with exports, if you just see the dip, um, starts off in April. Um, I thought this other chart was really interesting. Um, so this is basically Google uh, searches made by consumers. Uh, if you notice, right there in April, seafood restaurant dipped way down. Um, seafood delivery up, uh, seafood recipes up, um, sushi takeout uh, up and barbecue restaurant, it was used as a control, it dipped down also, anything having to do with a restaurant. And what that tells you is that the fishing industry, a commercial fishing industry, lost a lot of their wholesale and restaurant accounts. Um, not just directly uh, restaurant accounts, but also distributors that are buying for restaurants from us, let's say, um, to sell you know, to restaurants. Uh, um, this is the percentage change in 2020 Southeast monthly landings revenue relative to 2019. Um, this is landings, uh, you know, compared to 2019. Dipped way down, um, and that's due to demand. Lower demand from restaurants particularly. Um, it's kind of amazing, actually, when you look at it. Um, and this kind of gives you, breaks it down to different species. The only species that isn't on here that I thought would be important to mention is shrimp. Since we uh, personally, Wild Ocean does land a lot of shrimp. It's not on here for, I'm not sure why. Uh, no, I just didn't add it. I think it was just a little too complicated. But um, that would probably show a big difference to uh, a drop. Um, everything from migratory pelagics that include tunas, mackerels, mahis, things like that, to snapper, all dropped in landings uh, because of demand. Um, some change in uh, some change in price 
that actually went up or uh, golden crab, for example, but most of it dipped way down because, you know, no one was fishing for anything. <laughs> um, this is a, a survey. Uh, the, these are results from a survey that IFIS Extension sent out to commercial fishing permit holders. Um, and this is self-reported. So 94% of commercial fishing uh, permit holders reported revenue loss. That's huge. Um, whether it was minuscule or, or large, they, they all, nine, almost 100% reported a, a loss. Um, about a 56% uh, decrease in uh, revenue, 28% reported reduction in employees. Um, I'm sure a lot of businesses can say that. On um, average, commercial fishing permit holders reported operating at 44% of normal fishing. Now we're going to go uh, to the reasons why. Well, they were instructed by uh, fish, uh, not to fish by dealer and processors, i.e. us also. We just couldn't sustain that amount of supply um, and other processors, I'm sure, couldn't either. Um, low prices for seafood uh, and no crew available. And that's been an issue, I think, uh, mm -hmm. in every industry. Um, same, uh, very similar service sent out to seafood dealers uh, by IFAS, IFAS extension. Um, and you see very similar results. Uh, it's 86% of commercial permit holders reported revenue loss, 55% um, decrease in revenue, 46% reduction in employees, 6% uh, reported an increase. Um, and I think that's mostly due to people who had retail markets, because we did see an upsurge in retail market uh, sales uh, and online sales, actually, too. Uh, the 46% would be, my guess, is through wholesale, restaurants, so on and so forth. Um, on average, dealer processors reported operating at 48% of normal business activity. Reasons why? Low seafood prices, implementing health uh, measures, and loss of employees. Uh, this, uh, this slide talks about national trends. Did we just see that in the South Atlantic? No, of course not. We saw it uh, nationally. The biggest blow was restaurant and food service shutdowns and accounted for 70% uh, 70 of purchases for the industry's $200 billion annual revenue. So it's happened to everyone across the industry. Fresh product was hit the hardest because fresh product is often sold to restaurants. Um, and consumers, uh, they have more a tendency to buy frozen product, you know, when they're ready to cook for it you know, at home. Uh, they can just put it in the freezer and then put it in their fridge, so they have it in there. Um, some industries shifted from restaurant to expanding supermarket into online or direct to consumers. In our case, uh, our shipping business went up a lot, a lot. Um, it was definitely a smart, uh, it's a small part of our business, but it almost increased it a hundredfold. Um, it didn't, of course, uh, completely uh, replaced our wholesale business, <laughs> but um, it did jump significantly, and so did our retail. Um, like it said here, biggest spike of spending at retail with 28% boost. Um, almost overnight, food systems came crashing down, have left fishermen and coastal communities uh, economically vulnerable. Um, what helped? Um, some kind of recovery, uh, PPP funds that helped us. We definitely received some and we're very thankful for it. UFIFIS, I don't know if you, uh, the commissioners know, but they had a, uh, they have farmers markets and there was this token system that was funded by the CARES Act. So every uh, person that was um, consumer that was affected by COVID-19 economically was able to put an application every time they went to the farmer's market and they was able to receive $50 in tokens to spend at that farmer's market through those vendors. Um, we were one of the vendors, uh, one of the few places that sells seafood, of course, um, local wild caught seafood. So we were actually able to uh, receive some funds from that because of consumers, because of the CARES Act dollars. So very thankful for that. A great program. Um, and an increase in online shipping. Uh, like I said, it did go up for us. Thank goodness. And then also, I didn't put this on here, but an increase in retail, uh, our retail stores. So uh, super thankful. So um, we'll go over, lastly, the historical and um, how it's presently significant uh, commercial fishing here in Port Canaveral. And one of my favorite photos is this one, the dedication ceremony, November 4th, 1953. Look at that, all those people. It was great. And then if anyone was here back then, you would know that all of this area was uh, really populated by fishermen, fishers, um, their families, uh, people were loading, unloading. All this area was just shrimp boats, fishing boats, so on and so forth. So we're kind of lucky to still have at least two um, receiving docks here in Port Canaveral. Um, this was in the early 70s, as you can tell by the haircuts and the outfits. <laughs> Big hair. <laughs> just hanging out. 
Um, and this is a little more current, maybe about six, seven years ago. This is uh, 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 unloading a shrimp boat, uh, rock shrimp. That's Josh right there. Uh, that's Sherry's son. Um, this is also a generational business. So I think right now it's uh, two generations of both families that own it, that uh, their sons are working in the, um, in the business. Um, and, it, and this is a really great quote that I'm going to end with um, from Jessica Hathaway, which is the National Fisherman um, editor. Uh, because even a fisherman who goes to sea alone would be lost without the port to call a home. And this is our home, and we're so grateful to have it, uh, mostly because uh, our business is a very rare business to find nowadays. Even if Florida is surrounded by water, um, very few fish houses left, especially those that are owned uh, by generational you know, owners or families. So we're very really grateful to be here and part of the charter. And again, we thank you for the opportunity to update you on the state of the fisheries. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, thank you very much. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from someone who started his career in 1978, I was on a destroyer 100 miles off of Boston bordering Russian fishing vessels. Okay, back in those days, the Russians fished off our coast and took all our fish. Yeah. So that was, a, you know, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> um, but, but my question would be, it seems like your stats uh, for the COVID impact were bad, but now we're, you know, we're four months into this year and I would ask how things are going now. They have to, I would expect an uptick given the openness of, of our state. Yes, no? Yes, and I think uh, Gina and Mike or Sherry can answer more of that. Uh, we have seen an increase in business back with our wholesale, but I think during the pandemic, we also saw an increase in shrimp peddlers uh, meaning people who, you know, sell on the side of the road, who are selling to consumers. We see, uh, saw an uptick in that. Uh, some of our restaurant accounts have come back, but I'll have Gina talk to you about that. Thanks. She's correct. It, it has started moving forward. But with some of the restaurants there, some of the restaurants we feed are smaller restaurants in Southeast Florida, Orlando. And some of those are limited still. They're limited in their seating. And so if they're only a restaurant that serves 10 tables a night, they're needing to turn all 10 of those two times. And so some of those places are still not back. Our restaurant business is still probably down 20 to 30%, but it is better. When this happened, we could look at our list and we had three fairly large restaurants, Dixie Crossroads being one of them. Guanabana's down in Jupiter is another one and then 15th Street down in Fort Lauderdale. Those were the first three to come back, the first three to start ordering on a regular basis. But we do have high hopes that we'll be no more masks, everybody will be doing well this year, and it will keep going forward. But what was really interesting was to see the supply chain conflict, actually, because you have, we're like on that wholesale side, the supplying all the people who then either retail it or they give it to rest, they send it to restaurants. And we're on that side versus the retail side, which then comes from another angle. And so you could just see the conflict. You could just see we, we did, our supply chains didn't cross over anymore. So it was very hard for people to figure out how to take this product and what they could do with it. But while I'm here, I just want to thank everybody here and anyone listening for frequenting our place because the retail sales did make a difference for us. And we appreciate appreciate everybody for supporting that. And Thanks. I just want to add, because I do a lot of the shipping analysis, um, so the shipping is still going up. People are still um, buying from us, and we have a lot of returning customers from the shipping. Also, uh, we compared some of the 2019 numbers to today, and our retail market, it, like, she's, um, like Gina said, is significantly up. Absolutely. Another obvious question would be, the cruise industry, I mean, there's got to be some supply. Do you supply any of that cruise business? I mean, when that comes back, would that help? We limitedly supply. They will come and get supplies for us for most of their executive meetings that are on the boats. So they'll get stuff for us for that. Um, but we do get a feed from that cruise industry. From that cruise industry, and Sherry might know right off the top of her head, but I would say we tour anywhere from three to 5,000 people a year 
that come off those boats that come through and are just interested in Port Canaveral and what we do in Port Canaveral. And when they're in there, they become customers who will ship our seafood to their homes. Okay. So it right. is a feed for sure. And we've had none of that this past year, of course, as you guys well know. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I mean, do you all ship mainly in Florida? No, we ship all over the United States. We do you see any uptick uh, in the other part of the US? I would say, and, and Cynthia can probably answer that best, but definitely in Florida there's been an uptick in Florida because people having to stay home. Yeah, I've shipped as close as to Orlando, which is crazy to me. But um, also uh, the north uh, or northeast went up, and so did actually the Pacific Northwest. Um, we had a lot more orders from there, which is, again, surprising to me. So. Good. So you're almost international. Um, national, yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank you for hosting the Junior Port Ambassadors last year and hope you will have them back this fall. Ah, we'd love to. Yeah, that'd be great. We had at least one apply for their first commercial fishing permit. Great. That's great. Yeah, Jim walked them through how to get like that first permit and get started and yeah, a couple of And boys. it's a lot. It's a lot of regulation, you know, as you guys well know with just the things you deal in. Everything's very heavily regulated anymore. Any other questions for us? Okay. Thank, thank you again for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, as well as, as part of this cycle, uh, is there any public comment? Okay, no public comment. All right, thanks again. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Captain Murray, you're up. Welcome back to the DS. Good morning. Um, I can't wait for the day that I come up here and I start my presentation announcing a date on when we're going to start cruising. But uh, today's not that day. I have that for us today. Pardon? I, thought, I thought you told us that we got, you were going to have that date today. Yeah, right. Oh, uh, maybe I was dreaming or something. I don't, I don't know. Th th there's a lot going on. I'm going to go through some slides. They're, they're fairly high level. I welcome any questions uh, in any of the detail because uh, we've been totally immersed in, in uh, our efforts to get cruising restarted from multiple, multiple angles in the last month just since our last meeting. So uh, please, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point. So what has been going on in the last month? I'm going to start out uh, two days after our last meeting. We had a uh, very, very uh, short announced visit by the governor uh, who came in on Friday the 26th. He uh, was accompanied by Attorney General Ashley Moody, Secretary of Transportation Kevin Thibault, uh, Senators Wright and Mayfield from our, our district. Um, all the major cruise line senior executives also participated and it was a roundtable discussion uh, for about two and a half hours and, and the, the governor spent some time with the individual cruise leaders ahead of time. Uh, some uh, chairman was there at, at that point as well. I think I uh, can't remember everybody that was there. I know some of you were able to make it. Um, but it was a very, very well done session. We had it at Cruise Terminal 3 and basically the governor uh, was uh, planting his pole on the ground saying it's time to get our cruise business started again in Florida and uh, the reason the Attorney General was there was they were looking at all options available to uh, to move the needle. Um, that worked fairly well. Uh, then uh, we had another announcement that I'll come back to in my next slide. The following week the CDC issued their phase 2A instructions on technical guidance on how to move forward. Uh, that was widely seen as, as another uh, blockade and trying to get the business back moving again. Uh, this, this, I'll go through that in a minute and you'll understand why. Uh, so a week later, the Attorney General filed a lawsuit on April 8th against the CDC, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the White House Administration. Uh, another development, uh, just this past Thursday, Attorney General Moody filed an injunction on April 22nd for immediate relief from the CDC's conditional sale order. Uh, that was filed in the Middle District Federal Court in Tampa. Uh, it argues that CDC does not have the power to enforce long-term restrictions uh, as, a, as an agency, not a regulatory body, and it calls for the CDC's order a violation, uh, it calls the order a violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. You, before you leave this page, John, just real quick, I want to just shout out to the, the staff who put that event on in a moment's notice with, you know, very senior people uh, and it, it thing went great. You know, it, 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 
tons of news people were there, et cetera, et cetera. The whole thing was it was a nice. The venue was great, and the, and the, the logistics worked out fine. So we, we, we didn't have much time to put it together, but I, I will say that uh, we had a great team effort. Uh, everybody pitched in, uh, in to, to get it done, and uh, you can't ask for a better venue than Cruise Terminal 3. So, so on the on the cruise uh, on the uh, CDC side, the new phase of CDC's framework for conditional sailing was released on April 2nd. Uh, they, they, they tout four phases, but it's really five if you look at them. There's uh, phase one, then there's a 2A and a 2B, uh, a phase three, and a phase four. Uh, phase one was, was largely to conduct screening, testing of crew on board the ships, develop on board lab capacity for testing symptomatic crew. All of it's related to the crews on the ships and to ensure that every vessel attains what they call a green status, which means it's been 30 days without a COVID or influenza-like illness reported on board. Uh, if they have that, the clock resets and they go back into a red status and work their way back to a green status over the next 30 days. So it's quite a quite a cumbersome system. It's uh, not every cruise ship is, is registered in the system. It's only those ships that have a plan to come to the United States. Um, the list has gotten a little bit shorter, which I'll get onto in another couple of slides than what it was uh, uh, two months ago. Um, we're now in phase 2A. Phase 2A was just released on April 2nd. This is uh, implementing routine screening and testing of all crew, a uh, plan for that. Also to develop port medical and housing agreements approved by port and local health authorities. And after agreements are approved, uh, embark non-essential crew with testing and 14-day uh, uh, quarantine. One, one issue that a lot of folks don't realize is the cruise ships are you know coming and going in out of the ports we've got two that have been three at some points off of the cape canaveral that have been coming in on technical calls but the way the cdc has this order in place right now uh, only essential crew are on these ships they're operating with somewhere around 100 crew members to keep these these big uh, floating cities alive so that is not what what's going to be required when they uh, when they start operating some of the ships that aren't in the U.S. Uh, program with the CDC have more crew members on board. Uh, it's a lot to maintain these ships, and uh, the, the restriction is trying to, the, the CDC restriction is trying to keep as few people on the ship as possible to uh, limit any, any possible infection. What 2A does is it clears the pathway to start bringing crew members back. Now, you think about a cruise ship, you've got Broadway shows, you've got uh, you know ballets, you've got theater, you've got entertainment uh, all over the ship. None of those people are on the ships right now. They've all been sent home for the last uh, you know 12 to 14 months, and uh, they all have to come back and train and learn the ship. and And it's it's going to be a it's going to be a challenge getting started for all of the cruise lines. It's going to take time, but they can't bring those people back until we get through Phase 2A. So we're one month into Phase 2A now. We're working very very closely with. Uh, with four of the five cruise lines. Um, I think there's nothing here that's, that's uh, uh, radical. It's not a legal document or anything we have to produce. It's, it's a procedure, guidelines. Uh, we, we've taken the, the, um, the, the CDC, uh, passed out a, a checklist, and we've gone through the checklist with all of our cruise partners and decided who's doing what, and uh, we're, we're pretty much finished. Uh, what we are doing is the port side and uh, we're presenting that to the cruise lines this week and, and trying to work through this. But uh, uh, everyone's trying to work within these guidelines, but I can tell you that, that there's nothing easy about it, and there are a lot of um, parts of it that, that are creating worst-case scenario exercises, for example, that are just taking a lot of time, and when you finish, you realize that there's no worst-case scenario that you can come up with that's going to create a, a crisis in our port. So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, Phase 2B, that's when they start bringing the passengers back uh, and run simulated trials. Uh, keep in mind when I reported all this on the CDC guidelines way back in, in uh, October, November, November I guess was the first time that these rules were out, the, the lines all have to run simulated, one or more simulated voyages with non-revenue passengers on board, prove that they can operate without a, 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 a COVID breakout and then they can uh, proceed with passengers when they finally get to phase four. Just to put a timeline on this, we started phase one on November 1st, basically, of last year. Phase two just started in uh, April 2nd, 
so five months in phase one. So if you apply some similar formula to the rest of it, it's not going to happen anytime soon, uh, especially given some of the timelines between crude only sailings and passenger sailings. There's minimum timelines in there, 30 days for one component, 60 days for another. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough act to follow, but we're doing it. I realize these are just bullet points, but none of this, this administration is pushing vaccines so hard, but there's nothing on here that actually contemplates the fact that millions of Americans are now vaccinated. Does that, am I reading that right? Yeah, you're reading it correctly. I'm, I'm going to jump to the next slide though, because. Okay, sorry. For the first time, the CSO framework uh, talks about vaccines, but uh, you know, we, we put the slide up here on the right because that came from the CDC, what you can safely do once you've been fully vaccinated. And, and it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, free to, to start moving around and, and do things. Um, but with this new framework came out, it's the first time that we've had any feedback from the CDC addressing vaccines. They recommend that all port personnel, cruise passengers and crew get a COVID-19 vaccine. They did not mandate it, they recommended it. Uh, port employers should encourage employees who interact with cruise ships to get a vaccine. And port authorities and cruise ship operators should consider hosting vaccine clinics for personnel. Um, for, so, for those of you that don't know, uh, Lester Bullock called me a, a month or so ago and uh, they, they ran a clinic down at uh, Victory Cruise Line. He was getting his, his uh, employees all vaccinated. Uh, we had uh, about 53 of our port employees and family members and all down there were vaccinated as well. So we had that clinic and, and that was quite successful. Um, with the new CDC guidelines, we're going to host another clinic on May 12th. We're going to do it at Cruise Terminal 1. Uh, Parish uh, Health is going to uh, sponsor the, the vaccines for us. And our goal and intent is to reach the maritime community, our cruising community, the longshoremen. I've, I've already spoken with uh, Coach Callum out here to see how many of our porters we can get down. Anybody that hasn't been vaccinated yet that's going to be instrumental in getting our cruise business going, we're going to try and get them down. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, uh, shuttle buses, uh, anybody that's that's going to be in contact with, with the uh, with the uh, cruise passenger community, we want them to uh, come down. So uh, we're hopeful that we'll, we'll have a good turnout. It's, it's, uh, as you all know, it's getting harder and harder to, to you know, uh, expend the vaccine uh, supply. So um, we're, we're hopeful that we can at least get some of the folks that haven't, uh, haven't participated yet that are involved in our industry to come down and, and participate. So with, uh, with that, and if anyone has any specific questions on the CDC orders, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, I, you know, I could talk for hours, as you know, after our pre-briefs. It's, uh, it's a lot of data, and uh, it's, it's hard to consolidate it into a short presentation. Um, so just where are we in Port Canaveral right now? We've got Carnival, Disney, MSC, Royal Caribbean sailings are all canceled through June. Norwegian Cruise Line sailings are canceled through August of 21. Uh, on April 5th, which was the Monday following the CDC technical guidelines release, Norwegian Cruise Line submitted to DC its US return to cruise plan beginning in July with fully vaccinated passengers and crew. They have sent two follow-ups that, that I know of to the CDC requesting a response and have yet to have any positive or negative reply from the CDC on their, their concept for operations. World cruises continue to sail. Um, the reason that CDC list that I mentioned, the green list is getting shorter is uh, some of the ships that are on it are getting deployed off, offshore. Uh, they're leaving the, the US market for the summer and they're gonna be operating in other places around the world. Uh, Costa Cruises, which is a carnival subsidiary, there are three additional vessels that are gonna operate this summer in Eastern Western Mediterranean. MSC Cruises has nine additional ships to begin sailing throughout Europe during the summer months. They have uh, new sailing starting as recently as, in the, as soon as the next two weeks. Disney Cruise Line, the Disney Magic, will begin UK sailings in mid-July, uh, only available to UK residents. John, what kind of restrictions do the ships have that um, are cruising out, out of the US? Well, uh, Wednesday here that are safe. That, that are going somewhere else. And these are, the, these are all sailings that are reported since last month. I reported some last month. They, they, they all have very, very strict protocols on board. The protocols, uh, there's a safe sail panel that is put together. It, it in, included uh, Scott Gottlieb was, is on the panel, and, and they put the recommendations to the CDC last September on how they could cruise safely. Med shipping started sailing in August in Europe. 
they've got a protocol of, of you, you get a PCR test before you get on the ship. Three days before you get to the ship, you get a, a, an antigen test, you get on, and now you're in the bubble, and they operate for a, for a week, and, and uh, you're inside that bubble. You're safe. Um, there's, there was even one, uh, one comment or a commentator in, in Europe uh, this past week that said you're safer on a cruise ship in Europe than you are ashore with the, with the outbreak in Europe. Uh, the protocols are pretty tight, and, and the cruise lines uh, follow them very closely. And, and you know, what, what you have to understand is this is their livelihood. This is their business. They don't want people getting on their ship and getting sick. So if they can avoid it, they're going to. So when it, when it, really, when the cruises do open up in the U.S., these ships are going to be really pretty well organized in the procedures <coughs> that, that uh, CDC has required well, these ships are operating in other countries, so... No, but the ones that come here. The we, ones that... Disney, I mean... Uh, Disney Magic has is, is, uh, been in Europe and... and the company will have been able to get oh, yes. procedures in place so that oh. their ships that are coming to the U.S. will have step-by-step-by-step by step by step what they need to do. To they, they already have the procedures. The procedures aren't, aren't that complicated. And, and, and uh, the Healthy Cell Panel put, put their guidelines to the CDC and... And, and they want to get back to work, and they want to get back to work safely, and they don't want a passenger to get on that ship and get sick, have a bad experience, and, and never come back. Many times it's only the government that gets more complicated. Yes, I think that's a fair way to put it. Uh, you know, the procedures that they outlined in, in, with, with med shipping back in, in August have been in place now for nine months. They've got nine months of data. They can, you know, you know, tell you exactly what their experience has been, how many cases, what they've done. I mean, they've got a, a track record. Uh, that track record doesn't translate to the U.S., unfortunately. So so what cruise lines are, most of them are public companies. They have shareholders. They have to earn a profit to stay alive, and, and they have shareholders that demand that. And, you know, you can't blame them for trying to seek other ways to, to earn an income during their, their heaviest season in, in the summer season. So... Uh, this is, this is what's going on. Uh, NCL is going to sail the Norwegian Jade out of Athens, Greece, starting July 25th. The Joy will be sailing from Jamaica. We can fly to Jamaica, get on a cruise ship, cruise to the Caribbean, and then fly back. Uh, Norwegian Gem will be doing the same thing out of Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, starting August 15th. Seaborne, another Carnival subsidiary, their high-end subsidiary, is, is sailing one ship out of Barbados, round trips out of Barbados to the Eastern Caribbean. That will be home ported there. There's another ship sailing out of Greece, for them in July. Virgin Cruise Line, Scarlet Lady, brand new ship, Miami uh, based uh, cruise line. It was uh, kind of unique, red ships, uh, Richard Branson behind them, uh, all adults, 18 and over. Uh, they've taken the ship back to the Europe and they're gonna run it out of the UK. Uh, that ship hasn't sailed with passengers yet. So the UK, it was supposed to be Miami was the first voyage, but it's now gonna be out of the UK. All crew, pa crew and passengers will be fully vaccinated on that. Uh, Royal Caribbean's Anthem of the Seas will be sailing out of the UK beginning July 7th, vaccinations required. I reported last month the Odyssey of the Seas, uh, Royal's newest ship, largest ship, will be sailing out of Haifa for the summer, Israel. So the ships are going back to work. They're just not going to work here. And, and thus the thousands of jobs that are affected. And the thousands of jobs. And uh, all, all of the folks, uh, the Bahamas are doing well. They've, they've got uh, two, two home ports that I'm aware of right now that are going to be operating. Royal's got one. They're, uh, they're going to be operating with uh, the Hilton Hotel and it's going to be the cruise terminal per se. People will go in, they'll check, they'll get tested, and then they'll be deployed from the hotel to the ships. They don't have cruise terminals per se in, in Nassau, but they've got a plan. And they're moving forward. And all those jobs that are clearing people and, you know, getting the baggage on the ships and all is going to be in Nassau and not, not in a Florida port. So, unless you have any more questions on cruise, I can talk for, uh, for an hour, but uh, I'll, I'll try not to. So, let's go into something a little bit more positive right now, our cargo update. Uh, we, we're doing quite well, and, and that's showing in our numbers. Uh, our revenue is, is 5.2 million uh, year to date, tonnage is 2.4. Our mobile harbor crane, I got a picture here, the, the Trident Subbasin has a, a new fendering system over there, which was uh, assembled at, uh, at North Cargo Berth 8, and we moved the mobile harbor crane over to North 8 to, uh, to put these in the water, and they were floated over to the Trident Basin. Um, lumber it continues to be very, very strong at the port. Uh, I was meeting with uh, Brian Hubert last week from ASI, and we were looking out the window. We had three lumber ships working in Port Canaveral simultaneously. 
So it was, uh, it's, it's very, very strong in the port. Our slag is, is uh, doing well. Uh, all of our all of our cargo lines are, are doing well right now. Even even the uh, oil business has is, is be, been returning, so we're doing doing well on cargo. And that's even with the price of lumber up. How much, Mike? It's lumber up these days. At least fifty percent, maybe. maybe yeah, I think I think a sheet of plywood was what seventeen dollars a year ago, and now it's over fifty. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, two by four and uh, well I'll, I'll talk about uh, my assistant Jenny we put a fence at their house a year ago she told me last night that they repriced the fence and if they re did it this year instead of last year it would have cost them three times as much money just in the materials alone so it's it's uh, it's crazy but it's good for the port all that lumber is flowing through our our, uh, our port so um, communications update I'll give you a couple of uh, quick bullets here we had uh, Governor DeSantis uh, round table and, and you can see the photo there it was uh, quite uh, quite a great presentation for the for the governor's uh, uh, visit just uh, cruise terminal 3 is a spectacular facility uh, we also uh, had Fox Business News out here for a full day again uh, they came out and, and we put them last time they were at cruise terminal 3 this time we went to cruise terminal 10 and uh, Ashley Webster who's one of their uh, reporters that's uh, here in Florida now uh, normally from New York uh, came out and spent 10 hours at the terminal, so we got a, we got a lot of first-hand coverage in the uh, national media. Uh, social media engagement, uh, we had 55,000 on the uh, manned launch at Cape Canaveral, at Port Canaveral, and uh, we had the first vessel reflagged at Port Canaveral. I, I know some of you saw the big black ship that was outside of Cruise Terminal 1 for about a week, and uh, that was a Hapag Lloyd ship. It was renamed the Delaware Express, and uh, we put some some media out on it. Did a presentation with the uh, with the ship's captain, and uh, she sailed out of here with a, a full complement of American Mariners. So that was a good thing. Um, the government relations, uh, the Marina evacuations bill was unanimously passed by both House and Senate chambers. It awaits the governor's consideration and signature before becoming law. That's our bill that uh, would uh, mandate the marinas clear out before a, a, a storm, approaching storm, and we get to the, that status that we need the, the harbor cleared. So that's uh, very positive for our port. Uh, the official wildlife legislative package for operation and safety of motor vehicles and vessels uh, that was uh, um, supported language to improve and strengthen our derelict vessels and get them out of the waters and also provides the law enforcement to establish temporary safety zones <coughs> during space asset recoveries, which if you've seen on the news lately, that's that's a big issue still with the next landing. I guess I think it's going to the Gulf and they're worried about yeah. small recreational boaters getting around it. So we're, this is going to provide a safety zone so when they start landing in the Atlantic, uh, we won't have those same issues. Um, Senate voted unanimously to support, the, and the bill's gone to the House for final consideration. And the session's up this week, so there may even be an update if Diane has anything she can jump in and add. Uh, the state preemption of seaport regulations, that bill started uh, to affect, Senator Boyd filed the bill originally. It, it was uh, uh, covered all ports in the state of Florida. Uh, there were a lot of ports that uh, objected to it, including Port Canaveral. Uh, it it uh, was narrowed to apply to seaports within areas of concern, which which uh, eventually it came down to four ports, the municipal ports, and eventually it was honed down to just Key West. This bill was a direct uh, reaction to the referendum they held in Key West last year to limit the size of cruise ships that can call the port. Uh, it successfully passed the Senate last week. And then it moved to the House for final consideration on Monday. It was temporarily postponed before a floor vote. It came back up yesterday, and uh, um, uh, the Representative Roach from, uh, I believe he's from the Fort Myers area, uh, submitted an amendment that rolled it back to the original form that included all ports in the state. And at that point, uh, the uh, the uh, bill was TP, temporary postponed, and they, they put it into the bucket to review later. Well, the review is over on Friday, so that bill is effectively over now. So uh, it won't happen until next session if it happens at all. Um, Florida Legislature Budget Conference, uh, moving states 21-22 budget this week, a balanced budget, House, Senate, conferees, included language to support the governor's allocation request for American Rescue Plan relief funds for, for ports. I'm happy to say that the, the language was included in the bill, and uh, I think that's uh, ready to go to the governor's signature as the next stop for that one. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Everything's moving so fast this week because it's the last week of the, the legislature and, and things happen minute by minute. 
On the federal update, um, two U U.S. Uh, 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 Representative uh, Matsui from California and, and Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut sent a letter to CDC Director Rochelle Walensky urging her to strictly enforce the framework for conditional sale order and immediately halt cruises if outbreaks occur on board. So it's, uh, it's uh, not helpful. Um, on a different note, Florida Senators Scott Rubio and Alaskan Senator Sullivan introduced the careful resumption under improved safety enhancements, the Cruise Act, into the U.S. Senate. It would revoke the CDC no sale order, conditional sale order. It directs CDC to remove any order or regulation that prevents all cruise ships from operating in the U.S. by July 4th, matching the White House time frame for return to normal. That bill was uh, heard last week and defeated by Senator Patty Murray uh, from Washington, uh, which also has the fifth largest cruise port in the United States. Uh, and with that objection, the bill is effectively dead. So there's no, there's no politics here at all, right? No, but that bill was is not moving forward. So um, it, it was it was great, but but this these these things have all happened in the last month since our last meeting. So there's a lot of momentum to try and get this industry going again. But uh, there's momentum and there's resistance. So we'll we'll just have to see what happens next. On the federal, we also have a letter from uh, White to White House COVID coordinator Jeff Zenz calling for review and revocation of the CSO. There's been no response from the White House and uh, or the CDC. That letter was uh, also initiated by Senator Scott and Rubio and had a large Florida delegation signed on to the letter as well as the Alaskan delegation. And on a separate subject, uh, Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski filed a bill called the Alaska Tourism Recovery Act to temporarily waive Passenger Vessel Services Act to address the Canadian ship cruise ban, uh, Canadian cruise ship ban, uh, Canada uh, banned large cruise vessels from entering their waters uh, until February of next year. And the way the U.S. law works on cruise ships, they have to have an international port of call uh, on their itinerary, or they're not allowed to trade between U.S. two U.S. ports. So the ships that normally would sail out of Seattle on an Alaskan cruise would always make a stop in um, a, a Canadian port, either outbound or inbound, to fulfill that requirement. If you can't go to Canada, you can't sail from Seattle to Alaska under the law, so that we're looking for a one-year waiver. It really doesn't matter if you can't sail out of Seattle anyway. So, uh, But that was an attempt, and, and you know, at this point, the Alaskan season is... is almost over because uh, even getting ships started in August, it's generally by the end of September, all the sailing, all the ships that sail to Alaska are coming back to their uh, southern destinations. Um, there's a companion bill filed in the uh, House by uh, Alaska Representative Don Young. Neither bill has progressed in either chamber uh, and probably won't. Florida and Alaska Senators and House members issued a letter to White House COVID coordinator Zents to review the CSO and provide answers as to when and how CDC's prohibition on cruises will end. That remains unanswered. Recreation. Okay, good news. Uh, tent camping is resuming. We've opened up, uh, extended the hours at Jetty Park. We've uh, brought back some of our our colleagues that uh, that, that uh, weren't able to stay with us last year, we brought them back and they're, they're working and, and I'm happy that we can bring folks back. J.D. Park is doing well. You've seen our, our numbers on recreation and uh, it, it's, uh, it justifies bringing our folks back. So we're, we're excited. We're returning to the pre-COVID operating status. Um, special events, we, uh, I don't know the list, but we had the uh, open season for uh, submissions on special events in the future. Uh, we're trying to get everything up and running. We've had a few requests like on Thunder of the Beach that initially we had some restrictions on. We're opening things up and, and getting things back to normal. Uh, we have a few details that we're still trying to iron out. The cruise terminals, we haven't opened them up for, for events yet just because of the staffing issues and, and cleaning issues. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated, so we're trying to do as much as we can with outside for the foreseeable future. But uh, Hopefully, we'll get our core business back running soon, and, and uh, we can start uh, opening those terminals back up for uh, events. On the engineering update, I'm going to let Bill talk for a minute because I'm getting kind of uh, hoarse. <laughs> so. Thank you, Captain Murray. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, uh, I will keep it very uh, brief today. I just have uh, two slides, I believe. Uh, this first slide is kind of an all-encompassing of uh, three different projects I want to talk about. Uh, one of them is a small, minor uh, roof replacement project, and it's on the Atlantis buildings that are just 
to the south of the uh, Maritime Center here. Project went really well. Uh, big thanks to Tom Parker from Doug Wilson. On wrapping that project up, we're in punch list mode, so that'll be done in uh, early May for final completion. Another project I want to highlight here is in the uh, lower middle photo. That is cruise terminal number five. We've talked about this a few different times. This is the, the first phase of a potential multi-phase project uh, supporting crews out of terminal five and cruise growth for bigger ships. So we're really excited about this one. Um, we have a current project out to bid. Those bids are due May 12th. Even yesterday we had another uh, bid walkthrough with uh, uh, contractors pursuing that uh, maritime uh, marine uh, works project. Those bids are due May 12th, and we will have that before you with um, uh, a recommendation for award at the May Commission meeting. So very enthusiastic about that project. And last but certainly not least, at the very bottom, we have North Cargo 3 Reconstruction. And I can't say enough good about this project because it is a renewal of a legacy berth at the, pro at the port. Um, that berth uh, currently represents some channel with restrictions. It sits right across the channel from cruise terminal number one. And I think the great news is that thanks to uh, Mike Poole, our CFO, and, and uh, Diane's group and, and many different uh, efforts of many different people, we have uh, secured that Merad Federal Grant. So really excited about that. $14.1 million from that Port Infrastructure Development Grant. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I mean, the, the obvious question, given what John just briefed about materials, I mean, are, are we sitting here looking at some huge cost increase here or hopefully these materials aren't different level of construction for sure so uh the 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 design for north cargo Bar three uh is predominantly of uh, steel construction and concrete not necessarily subject to the same lumber challenges that we see facing residential construction in florida however as we've noted on cruise terminal number three and the recently completed cruise terminal number eight authorized work, uh, commercial construction is at a premium. So when we look for electricians, low voltage contractors, plumbers, they are very busy. And so we do have some minor electrical work that's going to go along with this, some low voltage camera work, some waterline utility extension. So yeah, we do anticipate some amount of increase in competition for those services. However, the steel that this uh, project is predominantly built on, uh, we believe is going to face the same pricing structure that we've seen on recent projects. Excellent question. Thank you. So we talked about the grant support for that from a federal level. Also from the state level, we have another uh, large grant of 14.1, and uh, Mr. Poole has pursued other miscellaneous grants from uh, Florida DOT. Our capital outlay on that projected $37 million project is going to be in the range of about one to three million dollars. So it's a it's a great success for our team, and certainly we're really excited about what that means for our cargo business, future opportunities on the north side. And so we will bid that uh, July. August the bids will be due in September for award at that September commission meeting and it's programmed to start uh, October 1st the start of FY22. This is the only slide I have pertaining to the currently authorized work at cruise terminal number eight. This is the passenger boarding bridge from Adelte. And just a great note here is we were able to successfully test this bridge on three different ship call days. And these were just for crew operations uh, from Disney Cruise Line, no passenger operations, obviously. But it was a great opportunity for us to get out ahead of project completion on this gangway the marine side work, the land side work, those are in punch list mode. So those are, are, are on the very verge of final completion. And I just want to thank the PCL herd team uh, on the land side, the Rush Marine, side, Rush Marine Company on the uh, marine side, my team, Tom, Patrick, and Veronica, for efforts well done. Very high quality work has gone into that project. And of course, it's always a pleasure to work with our partner, Disney Cruise Line, on that project. So. Passenger boarding bridge is nearing completion, and I say this as we look forward to a return of cruising when that happens. Cruise Terminal 8 passenger boarding bridge, along with all of the other passenger boarding bridges we have around the port, will be uh, somewhat recommissioned as we do uh, another round of final testing for ship sensors, um, tide sensors, and whatnot that are now equipped on these modern passenger boarding bridges. So looking forward to that challenge. Uh, that's my brief, brief today. So... Please feel free to ask any questions. We're good.
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I've got one last slide. And it doesn't have any words on it, so I'm going to have to do a little reading. So I'll put my glasses on. So it's going to be a surprise to some people in the community and, and you board. The board has all been brief, but uh, our colleague Robert G. and Grzostomy, also known as Bobby G., has uh, Canaveral's Port Authority's Vice President of Cruise Business Development, has made the decision to step down from his position and retire from the CPA effective May 3rd. That's next Monday. Bobby G. and the cruise and travel tourism industry are perhaps one and the same. He's well known in the port business, the global cruise industry at large, and a longtime friend to many in the cruise and travel and tourism trade. Although he's been at Canaveral for a mere 20 years, his legacy spans more than three decades of transportation, cruise, and tourism career experience. During his, te during his tenure at our port, Bobby's been instrumental in expanding the number of cruise lines and ships at our port, both home ported and port of call vessels. He fostered critical relationships with many of the world's major cruise lines and has developed close friendships from the C-suite down all around the world. Bobby has been active in many industry organizations, including the Cruise Line International Association, Florida Caribbean Cruise Association, Visit Florida, and Space, Flor Space Coast Florida Tourism, helping to make Port Canaveral one of the best known and most preferred cruise ports in the world. Bobby's request, he prefers to begin this new chapter quietly and without fanfare, and, and we will honor that, uh, but we had to do this today. Uh, David German, who's been working, former harbor master for Port Canaveral, who's been with the port for almost 20 years, has been working side by side with Bobby for the last three and a half years in the planning, development of cruise operations, marketing, and customer service. David will lead our cruise business development team following Bobby's retirement and carry Bobby's legacy into the next generation. Bobby is a unique character. He's a friend to many, many people here. He'll be missed. Thanks. Yeah, th thanks for that, John. I just want to add, put that slide back up just for a second. Uh, and I, you know, we all know a lot of people, but we, we would go to a trade show, and there's only one person in the world that could pull off that top left corner, you know, wearing the red carnival hat. He, he could pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's just it's been a, a real pleasure to to. Uh, to have him aboard here, and he's going to be sorely missed. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thanks. We'll miss him. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, we have um, our CFO, Mike Poole. Give us some financial info. Key to music. <laughs> <laughs> no music this month. Once a year. So good morning. The numbers that we'll be presenting today are halfway through our fiscal year, two quarters, or a full six months. Um, I'll be uh, comparing them to uh, the amended budget numbers that were that were uh, approved by the board at the January. Um, board meeting and we'll be also doing selected comparisons to prior year numbers um, as well so the first slide we always take this out how did the month of march by itself just the month of march look compared to budget compared to march of uh, 2020 um, how were those results so the revenues were 2.4 million that's 340,000 above budget we'll um, talk about the various reasons why cruise, cargo, recreation, recreation, being Jetty Park, all came in uh, above budget. Uh, Non-op revenues, <coughs> excuse me, during this month were 2.8 million. That's uh, significantly higher than they are um, in a normal month. And the reason for that is the sale of the logistics center generated uh, over $2 million in a gain on the sale of the asset. We report that as a below the line non-operating revenue. Also in that number, we got a rebate check of over $300,000 from Florida Power and Light uh, related to Cruise Terminal 3 energy um, uh, efficiency improvements that we, we put there. Expenses, 1.5 million lower. So March of this year, 2.7 million. If you compare it to March of a year ago, 4.2 million. So um, we're still um, seeing the benefits of those expense side reductions. That uh, $2.7 million in, on operating expenses are 255000 or 9% below budget. 
The overall operating revenues are $13.1 million or $737,000 above budget. Cruise revenues at $1.3 million or $58,000 or it's right on budget. Uh, if you look at the month itself in cruise revenues, uh, half of it was uh, Victory Casino, so the, the daily uh, gaming vessels that go out. The other half was uh, Disney had three ships, the Dream, the Fantasy, the Wonder, that came in during the month of March for provisioning purposes. So uh, we receive labor dockage when, when they do that. Uh, cargo revenues, 5.2 million. Why? How, what that did as a result of 2.4 million tons of cargo coming across our docks. Uh, that 5.2 million is 88,000 above budget. It's uh, the increase is the line items that John spoke to. It's slag. It's not shown here, but it's salt. It's lumber. It's space, military fertilizer, even fuel, even though we're below where we were at this point last year. Uh, it's still producing um, positive revenue numbers. Non-ship revenues of 6.5 million. Uh, that's um, leases, that's uh, recreation and our miscellaneous line item. That is above budget by 592,000. Leases are above budget by $112,000 six months into the year. I will highlight that number will start going down. That positive revenue variant will uh, be reduced um, the last uh, six months of the year because of the sale of the logistics center. We had three tenants that were in there that were paying us rent. The last uh, month they paid us the rent was through the month of February. So um, that number will be uh, uh, reducing over the rest of the fiscal year. Jetty Park above budget by 321,000. Excuse me, miscellaneous. I always highlight um, uh, that is below prior year because of ground transportation related to the cruise industry. Excuse me here. Um, here you'll see all the uh, operating revenue, 737,000 above budget, all the components, cruise, cargo, leases, recreation, and miscellaneous, all um, five of those being above budget. Thir uh, revenues of 13.1 million are 6% overall budget. Expenses, now moving over to the expense side of the house, the 14 departments that you see there are at or below budget. That 17.4 million in operating expenses is 5.9% below budget. That in dollars, that's 1.1 million, as you see, 18.5 versus 17.4. That 5.9% reduction, why? Mainly the same three items that we've been reporting previously, service contracts, maintenance, uh, and uh, headcount, salaries. Now, year to date, take, bringing it all home, six months, Operating revenues are 13 million. Expenses are 17 million. That produces a operating loss of 4 million. When you combine the interest expense related to our debt of 6 million, that uh, produces a net position appropriation that's required of 10.6 million to give us a balanced budget. Depreciation, 22 million. Non-op revenues, I'm showing that for the first time here. That's $3 million uh, when you, uh, all six months. That's the uh, gain on the sale of the logistics center, the FPL um, rebate check, and it's also investment income. You add up all those, it's $3 million. And the reason I bring that up is the change in the net position. That's the reduction in your retained earnings. Normally, that's been dollar for dollar the same amount as depreciation. It's not. It's $3 million below that because of the non-op revenue. So that's helping to offset um, the reduction in the net position due to depreciation in a positive way by $3 million. <clears throat> that's it. Uh, any questions on that or on, on the income statement, on the balance sheet, on the other reports um, that we have in the package? Commissioner Hadaway? Um, I was going to ask you to give us the Cliff's Notes version of your two agenda items. Um, they're sort of a procedural thing, but just to address those now while you're up here. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and they kind of do go hand in hand uh, with each other. So our debt service, our debt payments that we make, uh, totaling approximately $28 million, we make them twice a year. We make them on December 1, we make it and on June 1. One of the items that you have before you, it's item 2A, 
um, it's continuing the process of defeasing our regularly scheduled debt service payments. We did that two other times previously. We did it on June 1, we've done it on December 1, and these are funds that are budgeted. We have the cash on hand. We're just paying it off, uh, these payments, a month early, putting it into an irrevocable trust account with an escrow agent, the reason being it helps us in achieving uh, and maintaining um, compliance with our bond covenants, the, the rate covenants. Um, the second item, 2B, is uh, uh, asking the board to amend uh, our bond resolution. Right now, our bond resolution that the board has uh, uh, approved and we uh, implement or issue uh, with any debt that we have, bonds, bank loans, um, addresses, it's, it's a, a covenant that we make with the borrowers. And it addresses many things. And as my write-up says, it, it talks about any reserve uh, requirements, uh, any additional debt you want to issue in the future, limitations that it puts on, on there. Uh, but the third one is, what uh, banks, uh, rating agencies look at is, uh, what is your rate covenant? Are you at least, um, are your net revenues at least sufficient to cover that debt service that you're going to pay at least by 1.25% or 125%? Uh, percent? And um, when you look at it, net revenues are defined as gross revenues, so what all our tenants and our customers pay us. You subtract operating expenses from that and you get net revenues. Call it pledged revenues to your debt. What we're asking to amend the resolution is to add uh, government grants that we receive from the federal government, state government, local government. As long as those government grants that we receive are unrestricted in nature and can be used for anything like a revenue shortfall or that you would use to cover operating expenses or debt service, uh, we want to um, include in gross revenues government grant proceeds that are unrestricted as well. And th when, uh, with that, it'll, that will also help us maintain our uh, bond covenants, that 1.25 uh, ratio that I, um, that I speak about. Uh, and this, um, it, it would, uh, by us adding uh, government grants, it makes us consistent with other seaports, other airports, uh, other governments around the country. Port Miami has it, Port Everglades has it. Um, Port Miami has it because they receive money from FDOT on an annual basis that helps service the debt that Miami has on its books when they built uh, the tunnel over 10 years ago. Uh, the question would be, why don't we have a, um, why isn't this part of our bond resolution already? Well, we've never received any money from the federal government, state government, or local government unrestricted in nature. We receive federal and state money every year for capital grants that bill, you know, for bills projects, but nothing purely for operating, for op revenue shortfall. So um, it's a, a good news story. Uh, we just need uh, three people to uh, approve it. We need the board and uh, two of our banks uh, to approve it, and they've already approved it. So um, I ask for your approval on those two items. Thank you. Mike, would adding that would, wouldn't make our, our bonds a little bit more attractive? Or, because the figures um, that are used to sell the bonds would really, would appear to me to be a little bit higher, and therefore maybe result in a little bit less interest that have to be paid, but. Yes, um, uh, Commissioner Allender, that, that's exactly right. It's, um, it's, so our bonds, after we sell them initially, they're bought and sold on the secondary market. We're out of it at that time, but you're right. They are bought and sold um, based on market conditions. And you always want them, even though we are out at, uh, uh, after the initial sale, um, you do want them uh, when they're bought and, and sold between, you know, uh, on, the secondary market. on the secondary market with institutional investors, uh, you want them to be continue to be traded at market rates and not at uh, lower values, which drive up the the um, which drive down the value of it. And yes, uh, us uh, our strong liquidity position, uh, any money that we receive from the, the federal government. 
uh, that being able to be included as a pledged revenue to service those bonds that they have, yes, are all seen as credit positives that maintain the value of those bonds similar to on day one when we sold them. So yes, sir. Right. Very good. In that case, I would move to approve the financial reports for February 2021. Should that be March? It'd be March. It'd be March. March. March 2021. The statistical report, aging report, list of bills, list of disposals, attorney's fees, and commissioner expenses. Did she correct? Second. A motion. Okay. okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Five oh. I did. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, we're going to shift into uh, our consent agenda. And is there any public comment on the consent agenda? There's none. Thank you. Okay, we'll ask to anybody who wants to pull in, uh, Commissioner Lloyd. I have none. Commissioner Allender. Um, I have none. Okay. Any others? 3A. 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 Mr. Martin? 1A and 5A. Okay. 3A, 5A, and 1A. Okay. I'm, I'm going to add uh, 4A. <laughs> so we've got, uh, I'd like to get a motion. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me back up just a second since we're going to have um, the report on human resources. Yeah. 3A, uh, how about if we just, I'm going to okay. pull 3B. Yeah, that sounds fine. That way we get a full report on human relations and right. Donna from Human Relations can give us that. Okay, um, so with that, look, I'm look, asking for approval of consent agenda items 1B, 2A, and 2B. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, Let's get some little uh, discussion here on some of these items. Um, let's start with 1A. Um, for the same recent uh, reason, excuse me, as previously, uh, because I've provided some legal services uh, on behalf of Doug Wilson Enterprises, uh, I'm going to abstain from voting on that matter. Okay. So that's it. Does anyone have any um, uh, questions or discussions on the item? I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. So it's 4 0 approve. You're off the hook, Bill. Well, 4 with one extension. I, I, yeah, yeah. One, yeah. 4 0 and one extension. All right. Uh, move, moving on to uh, let's go 3A and 3B. Question. For 3A, um, morning I know we are quickly coming up on 12 months of our first round of layoffs and most of the changes proposed here are um, to allow employees that we bring back to have their sick leave reinstated Is that's that, correct do I understand that correctly um, I also know that we have um, some a lot of employers are having trouble hiring and it in an effort both to take care of our former employees and also to be able to recruit them back, um, I, I'd like to consider maybe making that, you know, 18 months. If, if we don't bring them back in July, if it is November before Cruise comes back, um, can we give ourselves some flexibility just during this year in this emergency period? I'm not saying a, a forever policy, but maybe make that 18 months um, for employees laid off in 21 and 22 so our policy is 12 months and also by the CBA it's 12 months so we would have to alter the policy to 18 months and then we would have to go to the union and speak to them about altering the CBA as well is that something that the staff would want to consider looking at or is that something the staff would want to consider I believe it's so. something we can consider and and if we have the flexibility to do that then that's you know if you give us the flexibility we'll we'll take care of our people i think it's a it's a policy that we've got written it's in the uh in the uh contract with the union so uh, as long as we have the board's approval to be flexible i think we can handle it yes absolutely on our own 
uh, not no further action beyond this this document uh, as long like as we have I'm sorry go, go ahead as long as we have the board's approval of this of this policy that you presented correct it would be both time off and layoff right right I'm good with that so should I move to amend yes please all right I'd like to move to amend the two proposed policies policy 2014-01 HR05 and policy 2014-0025 HR06 to include that for any employee laid off during the calendar years 2020 or 2021 who is subsequently recalled within 18 months of the layoff date will have the accrued sick balance at the time of layoff added to the employee's sick leave balance upon return from layoff. And I think that mirrors the language you currently have, but just yes, gives an emergency <clears throat> It does. And, and I don't think we have to do anything with the CBA because this is our discretion. Correct. Yeah. Wait Correct. Yes, you do. We do? You do. Okay. We'll deal with it. So we'll, we'll speak with the, with the uh, union. Okay, thank you, Harold. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second it. Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay. Again, so any, any further discussion or questions on this? Because this is a, uh, you know, a, a, I think it's a great idea, but it's a substantive change here. Okay. No discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very okay, good. You have your board approval. Thank you. And B. Uh, just a brief uh, overview of the of three B. Okay. But so um, this is in response to our attorney, our employment attorney's recommendation for the Equality Act that passed in February um, through the House. It has not gone through the Senate, but it is her recommendation that we go ahead and update our language. Okay. Then, Mr. Chairman, I'd move approval of consent item 3B. Second. Okay, motion and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, 4A. Uh, Peter, you want to come up and uh, just give us a couple of sentences on. Oh, Mark, Mark, Mark come on up. Uh, give us a couple of sentences on well, how we're going to uh, let the public know how much this is going to, well, not just recapitalize, but add to our security at our port here, which is what we really care about. Absolutely. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mark LaRusso. I'm the Senior Director of Information Technology Services. So this particular project um, is to recapitalize video surveillance cameras throughout the external site. So these are on the exterior. Um, I actually uh, had a slide prepared that just gives the people an idea of what we're talking about here. You know, picture says a thousand words. So Troy will pull that up for us. Um, this project is funded by a uh, port security grant um, and um, it is covered 75% by that grant. So the port does have a 25% match for it. So what you can see here is in this picture is on the left here, this is an existing camera. This is actually one of the locations that we're going to be recapitalizing. Um, and then on the right, this is a recent location that was brought up to current standards. Um, so you can, you can see there's a pretty, I mean, maybe to the, to the layman, it doesn't look significant, but there are some pretty significant improvements there. Um, these cameras are running, you know, 24-7, 365. Um, they are exposed to very harsh elements. Uh, we have one of the harshest environments out there between the salt water, the humidity, the heat, and the wind. So we see a lot of the, not only the cameras themselves, but all the associated infrastructure. So um, cabling, conduits, actual network equipment that's in the enclosures that you see on the pole, they break down. So um, we want to ensure that um, we maintain the security posture that Peter te Peter's team requires through the facility security plan and that we also maintain operational readiness. So um, there's a second slide here too. It shows you um, the, let me move that down. Oh, I'm struggling here, there we go. All right, so this shows one of the enclosures that have all of our communications in it. So again, on the, on the left, um, that's current and then to the right, this is um, the current standard, and there's, there's some pretty significant improvements there to uh, be able to deliver network to these cameras. And uh, again, Mark, the, uh, the picture on the left, the before, how long has that been up? So that was up. Oh, the cameras and everything. Yeah, so we actually funded that through, it was the 2013 uh, Port Security Grant. No. So we're talking anywhere from five to seven years now. 
So these cameras are well beyond their, their useful life. We had to defer this project due to COVID. We had planned to do this project last year. Um, so we, we, we had to you know, make some, some things, some changes there. But yeah, so you know, between again, the elements and, and also you know, they're no longer under warranty with manufacturer. We no longer get software updates. So they also over time can pose a cybersecurity risk for us as well. It was a good call, though, getting this one next to the slag and sure. salt mines. <laughs> yes, sir. It's probably going to be one of the worst ones. That's a good good picture. That was good. Okay. Um, that's all my questions. Uh, I'll go ahead and move to uh, con accept consent agenda item 4A. I'll second. More discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Okay, 5A. Yes, I, I just briefly wanted to share that I had the opportunity to tour uh, this company's uh, frozen food processing facility here at the port. Really impressive. And uh, I just wanted to point out this is a positive trend in us being able to successfully, and our, and our port partners, uh, work on improving non-cruise revenue it's 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 really an impressive operation and they're bringing additional employees so i think it's all good news good call yeah. absolutely yeah yep. thanks yep. so great job i'd like to move to approve that item second all in favor aye. Aye. aye okay great thanks um all right good job on the consent here i've got two uh two public comments uh, first, uh, uh, Sean Conway from uh, Merritt Island. Please come on up. Okay, I won't use it. <laughs> um, uh, my name again is Sean Conway. I live in Merritt Island. My purpose for coming here today is just to thank each and every one of you for your service and your staff. These have been very challenging times. And as I've uh, followed uh, the process and all the challenges you're doing, one, I'm just really impressed in terms of how you've managed the thing financially, in terms of during good times, um, putting money away to deal with a rainy day or a cruise ship ban, <laughs> I guess. So my main reason for coming here today is to thank you for your service, wish you well in the future. And as I said before the meeting, uh, uh, to the captain. Uh, hopefully we get good news here before the end of the year. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will take that kind of comment. Uh, secondly, Mac McLeod, please. Thank you, Mac. I just want to say that I was the guy that hired Johnny or Bobby G away from Miami. Uh, when, it, when we brought him here, as a matter of fact, he was he had fallen off. He's when I was going down to meet him uh, and interview him, I, he'd fallen off the bus and had broken his leg. So, so we hired a guy with a broken leg, but he turned out to be a fantastic person. I would say that Bobby G was the single person that was most responsible for the growth of our, we had already started uh, cruising, but I'll tell you what, Bobby G was a great man. I, I'm sorry to, that he's, his, his leaving poor Canaro because he, he was a super guy. And he, he, as John said, he was responsible uh, for so many uh, solutions to uh, our growth problem in the in the cruise industry, and uh, I too uh, commend you people for hanging in there on this. I, I, I it it appears that the CDC uh, wants to punish the uh, Florida and maybe Texas and everybody else, but uh, it, it is is a very sad situation. And uh, I, I, as I come to the meetings and I, I see where our cruising uh, partners are, are moving their ships to Europe and other places, uh, understandably that they have to 
to do this because they've got to, they've got got to maintain uh, their business. But uh, it, it, it's it's this very sad situation. And uh, and John, I, I appreciate your your leadership in uh, in in trying to solve this uh, very serious problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate those words. Okay, uh, got to our commissioner report spot. Uh, spot. Commissioner Royd. I have none. Thank you. Mr. Elner. I have none. Mr. Chairman. I have none. I have none. Oh, guys, excuse me. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. No, I'm not. Um, just quickly, uh, we've got some events coming up that were not talked about earlier. Uh, tomorrow night is the uh, Canaveral Port Ministries Annual Gala. I can uh, I guarantee you tickets are still available. Anybody who wants to go, uh, there's a bunch of us going, and uh, it's their annual uh, uh, show and fundraiser. And, and like all of us, they're, they're working hard to keep, keep their heads above water and, and to do their service. So that's tomorrow night. Um, the Propeller Club uh, on the first week of uh, Wednesday in, in next week in March. This, this month is Education Month. And, uh, they celebrate their, uh, particularly all the efforts it's done with the, uh, uh, the Rockledge High. You know, there's literally hundreds, hundreds of over 100 students involved in the maritime program there. And the Propeller Club, that's, they're the backbone behind that. And a lot of you out here as part of the port team supports that. And uh, so that, that meeting is, is an education meeting. And final event, it's not, it's before our next meeting, 11th of May is the annual Ed Lanny Day. Okay, it's turning 96 on that day, so let's remember that. Okay, and I know he's watching right now, and uh, we're talking about you, Ed. All right. Um, two other items. I had a chance to update uh, the, the Brevard County League of Cities. I gave an update of all our stuff, all the mayors, and, and they picked up the, uh, a bunch of the cities picked up the flag to help let her write, get crews back, that sort of thing. So that, I mean, I, I, that's appreciated of our um, fellow cities here supporting us in that. And finally, uh, last Friday, I, we were at the, I was at the, uh, the 45th Space Wings annual update, update of the, of the wing. And I, I just got, we got to make a point here. A couple of years ago, when, when General Wayne Monteith gave it the pitch, it was, was a race to 48 or something, right? The whole, it was, you know, race to get the whole, our, our region ready for one launch a week, okay? And we haven't quite got there. But I can tell you, last Friday, just a quick point. I mean, General, uh, it's Stephen Purdy's there, and they're talking in, in the real near future, we're talking two a day, okay? I mean, they, they're gearing up. Air Force, NASA, commercial space, and all of us, we're gearing up toward a, a, a two-a-day launch. Can you imagine that? Well, that's, it's coming, folks. And I, I talk about it again. I'm going to leave on an exciting, positive note. Uh, that's just wonderful for our region. It's wonderful for our nation. And, and we're going to be in, right in the middle of the whole thing. So on that note, um, it's good news. And we'll go ahead and, and adjourn. Our next meeting is uh, May 26th, 9 a.m. And thank you very much, everybody.